My name's John Leach. Uh, I was born in 1939 in what is known as the Pottery Cottage at my grandfather's house in St Ives, Cornwall. Oh, cool. And so you've moved to Somerset since then? Moved to Somerset after a five-year apprenticeship uh, in 1964. So we've been here, what's that, that, that that's 47 years, is that right? Yeah. 47 years, yeah. Yes, as well. So yeah. you've had quite a bit of experience as a potter then? Well, I've been a, a potter for 50-something, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. I've never done anything else. And so I guess that's kind of like a freelance trade, you're your own boss in a way then? Like, what's that like? But <laughs> um, I, I think it's wonderful and a great privilege today to be able to make something you want to make that is of a part of a service to people who, who appreciate it. Yeah, designing pots and making them by hand. That's great today, in this sort of rather plastic, push-button, want things yesterday age, <laughs> you know. I, 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 it takes longer, it's more expensive, but it's, um, if you can manage it, it, it can be viable. Oh, we brought my wife and I. She's Lizzie. She's our. She's part of the business. She doesn't make pots, but running the business. And we brought up our five children here. Is it going to kind of become a family trade then? Are they into pots? Well, uh, uh, no. As a matter of fact, they're not. <laughs> but they've all helped at various stages. Uh, you know, when you want a little bit of help, they've uh, knuckled to sort of thing. So. Yeah, 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 but none of them actually take it up, uh, taken it up. Uh, my eldest, Benedict uh, Leach, he's he's a sculptor, and he actually hangs the exhibitions that we have in our gallery. Yeah. Is there, is there quite a lot of work from kind of the idea to the point where it gets to exhibition? Because I mean, like, I, I, from my knowledge of pottery, like, does the phrase "pottering around" come from pottery? Uh, I, I wouldn't know, but we certainly don't potter around, <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. Um, it, it, if, I, if I'm asked to have an exhibition, I think I, I, I like uh, a year, 15 months, or, or even longer, depending on where the exhibition is going to be held and how many uh, uh, pieces they want, you know, other galleries. Yeah, so, um, yes, there's quite a lot of preparation. Uh, and it, sometimes it's very difficult to just switch on to doing exhibition pieces. You know, you, 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 it takes a little time for it to evolve. Yeah. And, and so when you're, um, when you're making the pots, uh, like how, how much will go, effort will go into like kind of a typical piece? Like, let's say, I don't know, like a mug or a bowl, like... Well, um, we, we have a catalogue, an online shop, and, and a catalogue uh, which echoes exactly what we've got up on, on, on the, the website. Um, and those are repeatable items. Take a half pint mug, 12 ounces or thereabouts of clay. Um, we know the measurements, we've got them all written down. And we throw up and out to the mouth. Uh, and that could take um, one and a half, two minutes. Oh, right. <laughs> but that's the quickest bit. Uh, there's a lot of processes after that. Uh, you've got to fettle the bottom by hand. You've got to seal it. Yeah, you've got to stick a handle on. It's got to go into the, uh, the biscuit kiln, which you can hear switching off and on uh, uh, as we talk. Um, then it comes out, it's glazed, could be decorated. Then it goes into this big kiln here and is fired up to 1330 degrees centigrade over th 37 hours, yeah. you know. Uh, so it's, in fact, we don't, th this kiln here on my left is, is it holds 2000 pots. Mm -hmm. So it takes the three of us, there's Nick Reese, Mark Melbourne, uh, and, uh, uh, and myself, it takes three of us 
two months to make enough work and have a turnaround of the next kiln. Does it, does it get quite hot in here when you're? Yeah. When you're yes, place? it does. It's okay winter, but it's you know in high summer it's a little bit um, warm. <laughs> yes. Cool. Yeah. And how long do they have to be uh, burning for? And how, how long does it take before they they cool down enough? That you can well, get uh, we we fire on a Monday, Tuesday, finish Tuesday about six, seven o'clock in the evening. It cools that night, Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday, Thursday night. We take the 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 crests off here, you know, from from the door to let it breathe, and then on the Friday, we take uh, the pots out. And in, in terms of quality control, because obviously you were talking about the fact that you're living in an age... And well, we're always to... struggling to get it just right, you know, and uh, um, the last firing was good and the one before that. So, but every now and then, you know, we're, we're all sort of... Um, uh, we're, we're just human beings, you know, and we might get something wrong. Uh, then we've got to correct it and so on. But it's, uh, it's very exciting because... Um, when we have a firing, it's the harvest of the previous two months' work for for three of us who are throwers. You know, we, we throw and make pots. So it's very important. It's something to look forward to. But you never know quite how it's going to come out. <laughs> Did you ever have to kind of like, you're so disappointed in a batch that... They get thrown out, or is it a case? Well, of there, there are some that are um, seconds. You know, we still sell them, but they're they're sold at a reduced price. Uh, just occasionally, something happens, uh, and the pot is rendered absolutely useless, and then it's only fit for hardcore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you mentioned the term throwing as well. That's the uh, process of making that? on the potter's wheel. Yeah. yeah, which is kind of I think that's probably what most people think of when they think of that because it's kind of famous as a in films like Ghost and stuff. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it is. It's a very evocative um, kind of um, process. A lump of clay. Human hands come and center it, you know, with skill, and then shape it. And it, 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 it's magical the way you can get a form from spinning wet clay on the potter's wheel. And so in terms of spinning it, it's with your, is it with your foot? Or well, it, it, it? when I started my apprenticeship, it, it was a kick wheel, you know, yeah, like that. But now I have to say I, I use a, an electric wheel, which is it's easier for bigger pots. Have any other of the tools of the trade changed as quite since you've been doing it? Well, a lot of the tools are very personal to the potter or thrower. You know, um, so we we adapt, we improvise. Um, we have certain ribs which can be made out of slate or wood. Uh, um, I use one which is. Um, my credit card. <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, it's flexible. Yeah. <laughs> My flexible friend. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you you can you can and you can shape shape it. Yeah. And if, if, when you've made a piece of work that you're really proud of, do you find it hard sometimes to sell it? Yes, I do. Yes, it's it's partly because it's 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 more unique. Or, or you feel, my gosh, uh, you know, it's a little bit of serendipity that's happened. But why has it happened? Can I repeat it? And you, and you, you, I put it away until I'm, you know, I've seen it enough and then I might sell it, you know. But that could be two, three years. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so this, this is the exciting part. You know, you get your disappo disappointment sometimes, but you do get your... Your more serendipitous times, yeah. Well, what's kind of like the, the big names in terms of pottery? Are they kind of people that you look up to, or so, especially coming from St. Ives, because that's kind of got artists famous. For well, them. and my grandfather Bernard Leach, you see, he started that pottery in 1920, and um, then my father David Leach, they're both dead, and my uncle Michael, he's died now, so. 
Um, these are people I, in the family I looked up to. Uh, my father, David Leach, was my first teacher, you know. Um, but I also work for uh, Colin Pearson, who, who's, uh, um, he ran a pottery at the Friars Aylesford, that was a monastery, so I was working with the, with the monks there. And then I went to Winchcombe Pottery near Cheltenham to work under Ray Finch, who, who's a very well-known potter. And then back down to be totally finished off <laughs> with my grandfather, who was a great uh, critic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I, uh, we had a very good relationship, but it, it was, he was, well, because we, we were a fairly close family, he could speak uh, or shoot straight from the hip, <laughs> you know, uh, and that was good. Yeah. Is that is uh, in terms of like a, a critiquing on pottery? Is that quite important? Because yeah. I guess you're aiming for perfection each time, are you? Well, yes. It's the next pot's always going to be better than the previous one. That's that's your motivation. Um, and then you, there are lots of ideas pent up, <laughs> and you you want to release them. Uh, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It's quite a humbling process. You can get extremely excited when you're fashioning a pot on the potter's wheel and you can get it right. And But there's other processes. The trauma of fire, and you're no good without fire. That strengthens it and melts the glaze. And um, we often say some pots can be uh, blessed by fire, others can be dashed by fire. You know, it's it, it's that that that's that's perhaps some of the more humbling points. Uh, you know, making a pot on the wheel, get getting an idea into three dimension, but it hasn't worked in the kiln. That's you, that's disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> You've got, got to live with that. Do you, do you think that because um, it all sounds quite zen in a way? Like, do, do you need certain kind of uh, personality traits to be a potter? Gosh, I've never analysed that at all. I, I, I don't know. I, well, I, my father, my uncle, my grandfather were potters. If they weren't potters, I probably wouldn't be a potter. But it was there, close at hand. Uh, I enjoyed it. I wasn't um, encouraged too much to become a potter until I'd myself made the decision. Then I was encouraged. Yeah. No, but do you think that you ha you've maybe developed certain kind of characteristics as a result of pottery, like the kind of uh, you're talking about the like being able to let go of something after you finish with it, or if it goes wrong further down the line, or does it frustrate you? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't know. I, I just know I'm a very happy person and I feel quite privileged to be making and creating something. The, uh, and hopefully retaining my integrity about it. You know, you can, in this world, you, you, you've got the skill to do something. You can prostitute your skill, and the danger is, of course, you often make more money by doing it because it becomes much more market-led. But it, 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 the way we work, it's much more product-led. You know, uh, uh, and so, but if you kowtow to every Tom, Dick and Harry who comes in and says, oh, I want you to make this, John, make I'll give you lots of money for it, you know, uh, then you're selling your soul, really. So it is important to try and be as true an artist by keeping your integrity as possible. That's quite important. So yeah. is, is your kitchen full of the finest crockery of your own stuff then, or is it...? <laughs> Not necessarily. It has got quite a lot of our stuff, but it's... Um, potters collect other potters' work, too. So um, I, I find that uh, it's, not, it's, it's not just all your own work. Yeah. But there's no tap. There's well, no I got my brother. Tap. My brother's a potter. Two, both of my brothers are potters. Our potters, uh, one in the States and one down in Devon. 
That's just a real family business in terms of... Like, well, well no, we're absolutely thing. independent yeah. of each other. But, uh, yes, we're, it, it has sort of stuck in the family. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. When you get together, do you kind of compare work? And oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. We show each other what we've just made, you know, and try this and try that, you know, talk about glazes. And so on, and kilns, different kilns. There are many different designs of kilns. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's a um, amongst potters, not just the family, but amongst potters worldwide, is is a really wonderful. Um, well, it's it, it's it's a, um, a wonderful fraternity and sorority of potters. We we we're not aggressively competing. We, we, but we have got so much in common to compare and talk about, and there's so much sort of trial and error in it. And so we, we trot out our successes and our disappointments to each other, you know. Uh, and it's, it, it's, it's very comforting, particularly when you're starting up in business, you know, which for me was in 1964. Now that you kind of you're at the stage where you are now, and if you were able to give advice to someone in your position back then, what what kind of tip, uh, tips and tricks have you learned along the way that you could give? Oh God, there's, there's too many to recount. But but well, the uh, major ones. I, w I I would say the the first thing to do is to find somebody whose work you admire and try and get an apprenticeship with them. That's a proper working. Uh, uh, training uh, with a view to um, passing out and starting your own business. That's, that's the best way if you want to be a production potter. But there are an awful lot of people who uh, that's not necessary and it's not important. But they want to be a potter. And that is they do their own one-offs all the time. That, that's uh, sometimes rather hard to get started in, you know, uh, uh, because you're making one-offs, they've got to be more expensive because you spend more time. You don't make runs of things, uh, which means you do quite a lot of repetitive movements in a run of 50 mugs or 100 mugs. But you don't, if you're doing one of a kind or one-offs, individual parts, exhibition parts, which Nick, Mark, and myself do as well. But the bread and butter of the business is the, the more service uh, side of the catalogue range. Yeah. yeah. Cool, and um, uh, so in terms of uh, the kind of the, you're talking about the uh, the green side of like your kilns at the moment, if you, uh, using wood as well to burn. How, how do you get the wood to burn so? Well, uh, um, well, to start at the beginning, the, the sourcing the wood. I've had it from uh, a firm, a, a little sawyer, a small sawyer and fencing firm, uh, seven miles from here to Hatch Beecham towards Taunton. And I've been having their offcuts for well over 40 years. Uh, and uh, um, we have to get the wood in 18 months in advance of the time we're going to use it because it takes that time to dry out, season. And um, then we've got a kiln. This kiln is a derivation of a Japanese kiln that goes back centuries. Uh, uh, the design and is called in Japanese Nobarigama, which just means chambered climbing kiln, succeeding chambers step up, which helps in the even distribution of heat within. And it's, it's, it's got lots of flues letting oxygen in and a, a big chimney to have the necessary pull, but it's all naturally fired. And, and it, it, it's today. It's good to think that it's the, the it's sustainable plantations. It comes from in the West Country and Wales and wherever, uh, and goes to this little weave, weave fencing firm 
um, in Hatch Beecham and I have their offcuts. And it's Larch and Douglas Fir offcuts. Well, it's a little bit what's available, okay. you know. So, uh, and uh, I, I make sure I've got some 18 months. It's been drying for 18 months, you know, so I've got to always order up well in advance. So think even further ahead, this is my final question, to think even further ahead to um, the future of pottering, like more than 18 months. Um, do you think that the kind of integrity and the quality will always uh, be able to remain as kind of a, a local thing where you can people can take pride in their work? Uh, how do you mean here? here? Yeah, kind of uh, just in general as well for pottering. Like, do you think it's something that people, because you were talking earlier about... Um, the market changing a lot and things getting cheaper. Do, yes. do you think there'll always be that kind of market and demand for it? I certainly hope so. Um, people like to know um, how things are made and most often, too, who's made them. I can uh, epitomise exactly that feeling I'm trying to get over to you which is when I get up in the morning, I put my butt on a chair made by a friend of mine. It doesn't make sitting on that chair any more comfortable, but I can think about him or her. When I look at my dresser, and I told you uh, um, just now that uh, potters collect other potters' work, just through choice, I can choose who I'm going to commune with over my cup of coffee. Doesn't make it taste any better, but it's a whole different dimension of appreciation of a useful artifact, a mug, or a cup and saucer, or a gruel bowl, or whatever, you know. That that's a lot of people in this world don't know about that, don't appreciate it because most of us are conditioned by the machine-made product, which is the same that side as that side. So, so, so there's a lot more pleasure in not living in the world. There is, the, yes. I mean, anything you you use or want to, uh, well, everyday things that one uses continually, um, it, they mean, thing, they can mean things, rather special things to you. They recall perhaps a friend of yours who's made that. It's just, it's just like a carpenter. They've got their favourite tools and don't let an apprentice pick up one of them and use them. You know, it's it's they're very personal things. And and a teapot, a mug, a cup and saucer, a dinner plate, a bowl, they can be quite personal in life. But for most people, they're they're not. They're just, it's just uh, it's a machine made product. It, it it does everything you know you want it to. Uh, uh, and, but they don't know about this relationship that one can have if you appreciate the handmade product.